up so you can pump and pump basically in the stomach so you can just like get a brand new infection. Yeah. I'm Gabe. Yeah, exactly. I'm Deborah Dora. Nobody's ever told me I write this pump, although I have written the past few years. Some people watch it, some people watch it, some people go for it. Oh, it's like that. Today, you know, the time is you have a job with somebody.
young fantasists, and I go, why aren't you guys um, having, why aren't you guys fighting among yourself? Why aren't you forming cliques and groups and having manifestos? And this will be good for you. And uh, I, I, got a, I had this conversation with Ellen Kushner, and I think it was at a, at a, at a boss company. And she told me, well, I thought it was a very, very important response. Uh, she said, she said, good fantasy is unschooled. It's unbelievable. All good fantasy is unique, and it's not going to be like anything else. I said, wow, well, that's a really good argument. And I'll have to think about this for years. He was answerable. I thought about it for a year, and I came back, and I saw Ellen. I said, so Ellen, I understand that you are the head of the uh, fantasy of manner school. <laughs> and at least she had the courtesy to blush. <laughs> From that point on, from that point on, it turned into manner punk. <laughs> yeah, it became manner punk. And from that point on, it was like, you know, like fantasy lost its virginity and could be as grumpy and liberally ambitious and, and in flight as, as anybody else. Ellen's gone through uh, fantasy of manners and young scholars and traditional arts. And there may be a couple that left out there. Yeah. And it's um, what Swift is called faction. Is it that theoretical? It's an interactive human nature, and I think it's a sign that of something good happening, of writers having ambition. And, and writers, when, when, when you have ambitions that you just want to change the world for the better, write good things, you make good things happen, you get right back to you, just as soon as I get my hand. Uh, um, and uh, you're, you're also going to say, say, well, I'm writing as much of this really good stuff as I can, and I've got to find a way to expand the influence of goodness around me, so I'll get my friends and we'll all be good together and we'll encourage other people to be good. And that's what's going on there, I think, as the larger pool of phenomena. We've still got to come to anything else except it says it's a good thing. I agree with you. Mr. Lynch here in itself about the can, um, you know, you know, you know, species can't go the opposite size of the Grand Canyon. Yes. I think one thing that's happening, or what I see happening, and I, I'm as resistant to having people pigeonhole myself as anybody else. Um, but I, I think one thing that's happening is um, mid-punk is coming out of, the way I see it, although I, I think other people would maybe define it in, in a larger way, but, but what I see is that it's coming out of a particular group of people, um, and there are people who kind of aren't in the club. They tend to be um, women writers, uh, not all of them, but most of them. They're started out probably about five years ago, um, and I would say Pat, Sun Cave, uh, Amal Al Motar. Um, uh, and, and what happened, I think, is that they're trying to do something. They see it as distinctive, I think partly because they're um, looking at themselves um, in terms of the expectations people have of them, which is that they're going to write urban fantasy, they're going to write stuff with werewolves and vampires. There's this huge world right now of kind of mass market commercial fantasy that's doing very, very, very well. And they're doing something different. And I think one thing that they're doing is kind of struggling, not so much struggling, because they're they're ha very happy experimenting and doing things. Um, but they're trying to figure out where they fit. I think um, generating labels, which I actually think is a good and interesting thing to do, um, and it's part of the creative richness of our field, it, for them is part of trying to out where they are. Um, and, and in a way, I think they're, they tend, they're people who aren't in the club. Have you asked them if that's what they're doing? Um, I mean, I'm not exactly they're friends, friends of mine. <laughs> they but aren't. Yeah, this is, this is not necessarily the way they see it. This is the way I see what they're doing. Um, okay. and, and, you know, I do, I talk to Kat about where she feels her place is in the writer world. And she does feel like she has kind of this uncomfortable place in that she's doing something, and this is one thing that I actually see as, if we can um, define the in some way, or we can categorize it, or, or see something in it. The one thing I do see that's distinctive in some of the stuff that they're doing, whatever we call it, is a kind of um, uh, uh, stylistic experimentation that wasn't necessarily there in the Ellen Dalton Um, I'm sorry. Oh, Pat. Um, one thing that I think she looks at is that she's writing books that are much harder to place. So people are telling her, you're doing something. 
um, this issue of stylistic experimentation. Because I grew up on this. I sort of see this, the, the mid-punk people, um, and a lot of it also comes out of the small press, which I think is important, not out of anything fancy. Um, but I sort of see them as the second generation fairy tale retellings. We all grew up on fairy tale retellings, and now they're trying to sort of do something different with fairy tale retelling. And I think stylistic experimentation is part of that. Interstitialized is completely different, but we can talk about that at some other point. Uh, I don't think that um, the argument Thank you. 
graduate student. You couldn't go, you, you, you couldn't make a table and check all of those off under every one of the you know the writer's name. There's simply things I think that floated to the top of Cat's head. Um, you know, it was an interview. She was talking fast. Um, We're typing fast. What? We're typing fast. We're typing. Yes, that's right. Typing fast. Um, talking through typing. But urban fantasy? What? You know, that has nothing. Certainly has nothing to do with me. It does not have to do, say. Um, with some of the other people on the list. Um, confessional poetry? You know, that's... Yeah, no, it's, 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 just an, it's just an odd list of things. Uh, it's not a thought through, um, it's not a thought through critical check, well, I wouldn't say checklist, but it's, these are not things that everyone can look at and say, oh, yeah, all of these people are about urban fantasy and confessional poetry. Of course, you know, none of these people on the list are like each other in that they're all, they all write like themselves and they're all um, intellectually ambitious. That's all you can say. Are there people, <clears throat> this is a, a question, this is not a rhetorical question, it's a literal question. Are there people who are not on the official list who are politicians to be placed on the list? I'm here thinking of, of New Year. One of the things that argued that there was a legitimate phenomenon was that when New Year was announced, it consisted of China Biezo with, uh, with, uh, um, with Mike Harrison as an ancestral figure. And everybody thought this was a pretty small movement. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and there were a lot of people were having these involved in, in the conversation. Now, obviously, we're sort of thinking around thinking, well, who else is on that list? Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> and I'm wondering, you know, are, 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 are the people standing outside of what is now canonical uh, uh, punk going, going, well, 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 don't you need something to pour the tea? <laughs> canonical because it's on Wikipedia? <laughs> yeah, that's the most modern. Canonical. That is the first approximation of canon for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All all yeah. Of Actually, and I feel somewhat awkward because she named me as an ancestral voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not dead yet. <laughs> to, no, two. Um, I don't think um, all of these people actually read me before they they just you know before they started writing. It's not as if they they read me, ran out, and said, "I'm going to be a writer." Um, I think. Probably all of them were, were writers from the egg, and, and long before they'd read, uh, you know, uh, you know, long before they'd read anything much more than um, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> yeah, Greer, except I think that. So this might be awkward to say, but I think you're kind of discounting the influence of that. I mean, I think that you. So. When I'm sitting around with other writers, we talk about the influence of Greer Gilman on our writing. No For kidding. real. No kidding. No kidding. Um, no kidding. So I think that actually, we, there were, um, and I can't speak for anyone else. And, and I, I, so a couple different comments. One is, um, I think that post New Weird, everyone got <laughs> so, duh, what's the word, so kind of grumpy about literary movements that as soon as you have a list, everyone wants to get off it. So that's what everyone's doing. Everyone, except for our mock inferno pressure literary movement that everyone was joining way back when the mock was created and it was gone many years ago, which is still on the web if you're interested, inferno pressure, not pressure. Um, but um, so everyone always tries to get off the list nowadays because they, they're too cool for to be in a movement. By no means itself, pardon me, purposes. By no means itself, if you twist on this, we have not yet <laughs> covered new twist in any of the dynamics we're exploring right. because a good 25 years ago, maybe 1985, 27, 28 years ago, uh, everyone identified as a cyberpunk right. was gruffly claiming membership. This is the oldest twist on the previous twist. They were pointing at the coffee house. Well, it was all the same time. It took 10 years for the list of new, of, of new waivers to go down to zero. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. You could, you could, you could get Christopher Marlowe sitting there in the Burberry Cafe.
Talent uh, Tavern going, I am so not the university wit. <laughs>
that is, is, is less literal is, is taking the material somewhat in the manner that the, um, that the modernists did. And um, I want to ask, this is uh, not starting out of the doubt. Have you ever read um, SF12? That is by Judith Merrill in 1968. Uh, that was probably the big cannon shot of the new wave. And at that point, I mean, many people speak of the new wave, they speak of the Greek language, they speak of the disdain for science fiction roles, science fiction, some hallowed traditions and such. But the old Aramon days, right? I mean, those are the days. Yes. This, this, is, this is when Mike and I were in our teens, um, gobbling this up, eyes wide. Um, but it's striking to go back and look how, for a while, this was never a movement that became large enough to be associated with the new wave, but much of it was striking strikingly non-narrative, non-linear. Um, it was more widely published in England than here. The other anthology that was most reflected this is England Swings SF, also at an AIG, Judith Merrill. Uh, she, was, she, she was more sympathetic to this than the literary portal editors of American side, such as Jim Carr, <coughs> were. And I suggest this only by saying that, I say this only by way of suggesting that <coughs> going back to modern well worth doing, um, is not being done for the first time. And I, I, think, um, I think we're we are different ways kind of perceiving this. And I, I still feel very sympathetic to the young Turks who look at what immediately precedes them and, and really see discon discontinuity or the continuity. Um, they, in the rear, they see continuity and discontinuity. We're going to be like her who's not like everyone else. <laughs> This is great, yeah. but um, this is it's not terribly surprising. I mean, I love, 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 love that there are so many wonderful and ambitious and mad um, young women coming. You know, okay, ambitious is not the right word. It's a word different. Mad. Plenty of ambitious. Ambitious sounds good. Okay, ambitious, mad, um, different. Um, it's it's a wonderful. But uh, on the other hand, to play devil's advocate, yes. um, coming up with boxes and titles is a way of discussing things. And if you discuss things, that means you can write articles about them and you can get attention for them. Mm -hmm. and, and even degrees. Or yeah. discourse. Greer and Theodora have a convergence here on some points. But I noticed earlier, Greer said, I do not like people telling me what I write. And Theodora said that she resists being categorized. I will have to say, I perfectly find people categorizing what I write. It, it is what critics get to do. It really is their remit. And when someone like Carl Nelson just give it a break, take this out and says, how dare this person tell, you know, claim that I, but I'm, you know, my response is, that, that is their job. Um, they do get you. If you are not you know, harmed by it, and you, you're, you're, you're proper boundaries are going to progress. So I, well, I think my hope. I think this is um, uh, whether we are drawing boxes and trying to stiff non-box things into it, or whether as we all hope we're doing, we are drawing boxes or we're drawing shapes around the things and getting the shapes right. Is an issue in itself up to interpretation and sympathy? So, what box? Sure. What box would you draw? Um, well, I'm
And at that time, which was a while, decades ago, in the uh, relationship male to female in, uh, in science fiction was something like five to one. In both, in both titles, individual titles and, um, and authors. And in fantasy, you're not gonna call this one, the relationship was slightly less than two to one male to female. I, in, even at that time, fantasy perceived as being primarily female, and it was not. Years after the other being said, would it change? No, no, I, no because, because, it, because that very little rapid to uh, the company. Okay. And so I'm, I'm wondering, is it really uh, a um, a uh, female, a woman dominated uh, group that we're talking about? And is say Christopher Barzak? I can't think of anything Chris has written that I've read that's been fun. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question, and you know, Greg was bringing up science fiction, and my first impulse is the academic impulse, which is to say. I don't know enough about that era of science fiction. It's sort of beyond my expertise because I didn't grow up on it. Even when I was reading science fiction as a kid, it was magical science fiction. It was science fantasy, basically. Um, you know, this question of male versus female is interesting and controversial and kind of hard to touch on. Um, I'm sure, I mean, nobody wants to form a girls club. That makes everybody really, really uncomfortable, and me, too. Um, and I would never say, um, you know, this is, a, a, a wholly or primarily female phenomenon to the extent that we can even see it as a phenomenon. And I do think that it, to the extent that we call something that comes, and we're not critics doing it, we're writers, but the, pri the primary um, reason for doing that and justification for doing that is that certain kinds of writing that's talked about, which is interesting, that's, and, and they may not have gotten talked about before. So we're drawing attention to something that's happening in the field that's interesting. For me, that's really, if we're going to talk about this one, that's kind of the justification for creating a word to talk about certain kinds of rights. And the fact that we argue about it and it's controversial, that's kind of cool. And we can not this in us. Um, but, ooh, those will come later. Um, but, um, yeah, I, you know, it's a really interesting question. I teach a class on fantasy literature. We do a lot on vampires. And um, I, I do end up with primarily female students. There is a there's a generation of women that have grown up on at this point they've grown up on Twilight, and that makes a really big. I agree with that. It's enormous. Like I, I ask my students, how many of you have read Twilight, and it's all of them. But it's all the women. It's the the male students may have read it, but they kind of don't want to admit to it. Um, and then we all talk about how much we hate sparks and vampires because they've all gotten over it. They're post Twilight. Um, and now we get to draft it. But um, I, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I, I do think there's something going on, and, and I, you know, I have to look into it, but I think there's something going on with the fact that with cyberpunk, et cetera, with the new wave, there was a lot of experimentation going on in science fiction that maybe was not going on as much in fantasy. Um, and I don't know. Um, certainly the stuff that I read when I was growing up, I mean, and I read the really good people like Robin Lee Finley, um, but it was, it was much more, it was still much more fairy tale-ish. It wasn't necessarily trying to, you know, do the Philip K. Dick thing. Um, yeah. Anything else that I was going to say? I um, the, the hop a bit, um, Carefully copied. Uh, some reason it's just uh, it's disappeared. I actually pasted in the, the, the relevant couple of uh, paragraphs of the interview, the, the Strange Horizons interview. Um, one of the things 
70 damn years he made is completely individual, you know, it completely unique then. Um, world and it was it was his it was his you know the it, it, it rose from you know deep roots it was his deepest expression of his worldview and that's what fantasy does and that's what young people do um, and then people copy Tolkien I mean she can say she's over copies as general you know a, a Tolkien all the generation loss and the Xeroxes and Xeroxes, but I don't think fantasy is over Tolkien, or over Tolkien in the sense that fantasy is about creation. I but fantasy is about making a world from scratch. I uh, okay here. I think I. I, I think there is something going on, which is in Chinese medieval, it does this whole over Tolkien thing too. I would really love Tolkien, I would never get over Tolkien, personally. But <clears throat> there is a way in which you read Tolkien and you read Lewis, and they're, I'm setting myself up here and everyone may disagree. Um, they're about maintaining society and finding the good society. I mean, Tolkien in stories was very disturbed by the kinds of changes that were coming um, associated with the world wars, the changing society. The, the, there was this sense that values were being lost and, and he was interested in maintaining, uh, and so was Lewis, this sort of core of truth and goodness and yes. honor um, in society. And I do think that you look at, at China and Yale stuff and you look at Cat stuff, um, I'm not sure about anybody else, but you look at some of this stuff, and, and this may be where, I see this as quite different from what you're doing, where what they're doing is, and this is the punk part, they are kind of reveling in this sort of social diversity and destruction and... Um, Havering in the ruins. They are hatering in the ruins. I mean, I, you know, for me, Perdido Street Station was a really difficult read because it is a kind of hatering in the ruins. It's a Kind of, and maybe this is where it does get sort of postmodern. It's like everything's broken. All right, let's party. Now what do we do? And, and the one thing I found persuasive about the punk use that, or the use that Kat was making of punk, which she said, is when you rip stuff apart and then you kind of put it together with safety pins. And I thought, okay, that is new Crobion and some of this other game of stuff. That I don't see as the aesthetic of all of the people that she yeah. mentioned. That is, the, you know, it is very much her aesthetic, and it's very much trying to be able to. You can group them, <laughs> you know, if you like. You shuffle around and put them together <laughs> and, watch and what see happens. what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm. I was going to say stately, plump C.S. Lewis. <laughs> I don't think I'm as stately in all senses of the word as Tolkien or Lewis. I am not into normative. You're not ready, and also you're not ready to get stood on a tennis ball and shout at my visions. <laughs> no, indeed. Yeah, very Thank recently. You. But um, neither am I punk. I don't think. I don't, I'm not right. about catering. Essay, which I hope you agree with, 
about Ulysses, hailing him out of Paris. And he was instantly interested in be writing about his own work, especially Wasteland at the same time, spoke of it as having a relationship with myth. A critical idea of this, this was systematic, that there was a main thing, a, a parallel between mythology and modernity, if that were, that was explored in a systematic way that yielded results that he said had the value of a scientific law. So he discovered something fundamental, new, and instantly usable. It's like the fourth law of psychodynamics. And you'll notice that Ulysses is whatever else it is, it's a very systematic one. Uh, for the first 30 years of its existence, scholars explored its systems. Now we're, scholars are saying, Homer parallels the work and writing of it, but not to the reading of it. And we're all so past Homer. You know, like Ulysses. We are so over. We are so over the Homer parallels and Ulysses. We're now doing other things. He did the same thing with Wilson. As he wrote, or it's just settling down to the most monstrously systematic system of uh, venture world literature in his way. And however broken they were to its immediate, to its immediate audience who felt that who read this book, who read the wasteland and only saw shards, who read Ulysses and <coughs> saw mockery of the genuine heroic tradition. Um, however it seemed that we do that, we look at it now and see how systematic, how vicious, how cathedral like was, I think, for saying it's very, very correct. And this is, for all the postmodernism, has a rather friendly relationship to modernism, as opposed to modernism, it's very antagonistic relationship to the Victorianism. Nonetheless, postmodernism capers in the ruins of these cathedrals. And that is not fair, so that may very well be Catherine Valente. Yeah, I'm going to end by asking Theodora, uh, what do you think Catherine Valente's most successful work is? Especially good examples of the phenomenon. I'd like to hear that. Oh gosh. Um, I'm on the spot, I apologize. Yeah, I'm not sure I can. To be, my, what I like best in Pat's work are her short stories, to be perfectly honest. And maybe this is my own, um, my own. Your own take, your own take. My own un uncomfortable relationship with. Um, what it is that, my own uncomfortable relation to the capering and ruins idea of the cathedrals, in that I like the capering to have some sort of shape. So it's my own kind of pulling back. Choreographed capering. Choreographed capering. <laughs> and, 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 um, and my own desire, which comes from being a fantasy reader, I think, for shape and meaning which isn't necessarily where literature is, seems to be going, and art, where the art seems to be going, um, which is partly why I read fantasy and like fantasy art. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, when I was co-editing Interfictions with Delia Sherman, I absolutely loved um, her short story, oh gosh, it's a, about Pastor John, um, which I thought was absolutely beautifully done. And her new book, Habitation of the Blessed, is part of that. And Habitation of the Blessed um, is a book that I'm reading, and I'm reading it slowly because it's very, very dense. Um, so uh, for me, I will be critical about her despite the fact that she's a good friend of mine, or look at her as a critic despite the fact that she's a good friend of mine. I think the things of hers that I've enjoyed the most have been shorter pieces because they have the most shape. And I find that in a narrative that is so dense, I tend to get lost. Um, some of my favorite China Yeagle things are um, the same thing. They're the short stories. I love Unlun Done. And again, it's because there's an underlying narrative structure, and it's, it's writing against a particular genre, and that gives it a structure. I love The City and the City, and it's the same thing, that it, it has the underlying structure of the detective. Despite themselves, in a way, there's a, or at least there's a tension. Like in Eliot, there's not a tension. Well, I don't know. Actually, I'm not a, I'm not an Eliot scholar. 
you can see my academic training coming through because I at every step I'm telling you what I'm not qualified to talk about, which is annoying. <laughs> but um, it, it's there. There's there's a kind of tension between the underlying structure and then the kind of explosion of richness. Um, so it's uh, a lot of the poetry that's coming out um, by some of these younger writers. I like a lot. I, I agree that you know Sonia's sort of an uncomfortable figure because she has a real classical sensibility, and that Absolutely. gives her a kind of underlying structure. I don't think she's capering in the ruins. I think she's making very small cathedrals. They're little mini cathedrals. Um, so yeah. Well, no, that's too pretty. That's too pretty. Um, Things have been mentioned like Kelly Link's Travels with the Snow Queen, which I absolutely love. I don't think Kelly is capering in the ruins unless she's capering.